And welcome everybody to the 142nd episode of the Minnesota Outdoor Skills and Stewardship Series webinars. We have a really fantastic topic today on owls of Minnesota. So Sparky Stenshouse, who is the founder and director of the Friends of Saxon Bog, is joining us today to talk about it. And I'm excited to hear what you have to say, say Sparky. So I'll let you take it away. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Benji. And greetings, everyone. I, I'm just envisioning all of you. I I wish I could see you all in person. Um, plus, my jokes will be would be much better in person. <laughs> but yeah, I'm the founder and director of Friends of Sags and Bog. But we're going to talk about all the owls of, of Minnesota, especially the northern owls today. Um, I used to be a DNR. Uh, I did bird surveys for the DNR for many years with the county biological survey. So traveled around the state, did bird surveys. And many years ago, was naturalist at Gooseberry Falls and, and Jay Cook. So uh, I do have a DNR history. <laughs> but there are 12, count them, 5, 10, 12 species of owls in Minnesota. Kind of crazy, right? 12 species. Other states that have more would be, you know, I think Arizona has 13 and, and Texas has recorded 17. But uh, a lot of those are the rare ones from Mexico. But Minnesota's owls um, are highly sought after by birders and photographers. There's been 10 of those species recorded in the Sag Zimbog, which is also hard to believe. But why do we have so many? Why do we have so many owls in Minnesota? Well, check out this map. We have three major biomes in the state. And let me try my laser pointer. There you go. This dark green is the boreal forest. Right up here, the northeast part of the state, great gray owls are resident. That's probably the most sought after owl in Minnesota, but there's also hawk owls occasionally nest there, boreal owls, northern sawwet, and long-eared owls. And then we get down to the central part of the state, kind of in the deciduous woodlands, and we have screech owls. We don't get those in northeast Minnesota, only extremely rare. Out in the prairie in this pale green, we have burrowing owls and short-eared owls. And, um, and then barn owl, yeah, that's a question mark. That's a big question mark. We're going to talk about them at the very end. But statewide, of course, most familiar to all of us maybe is the great horned owl and the barred owl. They are all over the state. And the winter visitor, the snowy owl. So, yeah, we have the habitat for, you know, different habitats for many species. And our owls are massive to minuscule, right? They are range from over here, the great gray owl, 27 inches tall. And, you know, when you see them in the, the boreal forest or in the Saxon bug, you think it's gotta be three feet tall, <laughs> not quite. But then you work down great horned owl here, snowy owl, 22 inches, barred owl, 21, hawk owl, 15 inches, same as long-eared owl and short-eared owl. And then you get down to the little guys, the boreal owl only 10 inches tall when you see them kind of say they're, they're about the size of a square kleenex box one of those little square kleenex boxes <laughs> then screech owl and saw owl our smallest one at eight inches all right hold on sparky why are we looking at voles now well <laughs> voles power the owls in minnesota check this out of all these 10 species, those are the ones that eat almost exclusively voles. And you know, you can lump in mice there, but primarily voles. Voles power the owls in Minnesota. Now, if I hit the button again, we'll see that barred owl pops up with a red voles plus and the screech owl does too, because in winter, that's kind of what they're eating. They're eating mostly small mammals and, and voles. Um, now, if I hit the button one more time, we're going to see those exceptions and the great horned owl, as you can guess, giant talons, they eat big stuff like rabbits and skunks and squirrels. Um, yep, they're impervious to skunks. That uh, odor does not bother them. Barred owls in the summer eat a lot of frogs and snakes uh, and birds too. And same with screech owls. So that's just the kind of the point I want to get, get through is that meadow voles, um, and redback voles in the boreal forest kind of power all our owls. 
but what's the deal with voles? <laughs> Why them? Well, first of all, there's a lot of them. They're sexually mature at 20 days old. They can have five to eight litters a year, three to 11 pups per liter, litter, up to 80 offspring a year. So theoretically, one female vole is able to produce 1 million descendants in one year. But as we know, there's a very high mortality rate and, uh, and they're food for many critters. But here's the kind of the but. They're on a boom bust cycle about every four years. And so the owls populations kind of fluctuate with the boom bust of the voles. And if there's a boom bust up in Canada, that might affect us here as well. So we're gonna talk about that as we go through here. But when the voles are at their low end further north, we might get an eruption and it's IRR option, <laughs> eruption. Uh, this is Christmas bird count data from the Sac Zimbog. You know, a Christmas bird count is just a 15 mile diameter circle. That's it, 15 miles. You know, you might have a dozen people counting for half a day or a full day, but in Hawk in Sac Zim, it's usually a half a day. So in 1994, we had 139 rough-legged hawks in that little circle. They're vole eaters, zero the year before and zero the year after. 04, 05, I'm gonna talk a little more about this eruption. 70 great gray owls in that circle, 70, zero the next year. 42 hawk owls in the circle, zero the year before, zero the year after. So voles, you can't talk about owls without talking about voles. So we kind of talk about it as the invasion of the vole snatchers, uh, especially in winter. And I'm going to start out with, uh, you know, kind of the number one owl <laughs> in Minnesota. Um, that's according to humans, of course. But the great gray, you know, we saw 27 to 29 inches tall, four and a half to five foot wingspan coming right at you. I vividly remember my first one. I, I went to UMD and I'm going to date myself here, but 1981, <laughs> Kim Eckert took uh, a bunch of us up to the bog and I saw my first great gray owl. So I've never been quite the same since. Tallest owl in North America as well. We, you know, here's a neat picture to show you the size. This is Chris Neary, who does a lot of banding over at Whitefish Point in Michigan, the UP of Michigan. But look at the size of these guys. And they are mellow. They are very mellow. But they are not the heaviest. Not at all. Snowy owls, a big female snowy owls. And I should say, like hawks, the females owls are much bigger than the male owls. So a big female snowy might be over four pounds, almost twice the weight of a great gray. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> Great gray is all feathers. You put them in a bucket of water, you know, they're nothing. It's all insulating water because they are insulating feathers because they are adapted to very, very cold conditions. Um, we call it the phantom of the north, you know, and, and until you see one or 20 or 500, but you're going to think of them as the phantom, right? Because they're hard to find. And check this one out. Blue. Uh, blends right in there with that trunk of that tree. But I'll show you one trick. You got to drive slow, A, or walk slow. But look at that white bow tie. It just stands out even in the dreariest of days. Here's another example. Look at this one tucked back in the brush. But look at that white bow tie right there. This one, not facing us, heavy snow. Hard to see, could drive right by that. Turns towards us, once again, white bow tie. So why are great grays such a big deal? They have a huge range in the world, but you know what? The easiest place to see them in the lower, well, I would say in all of North America. And uh, yeah, I would say all of North America is Northern Minnesota. They nest here, they're year-round year residents. In fact, in the Saxonbog this year, we're only seeing the resident birds so far. That population out here in the Rocky Mountains is, is pretty small, relatively small, but they get way down in here to Yosemite. <laughs> you know, it's, we don't think of great grays in California, but also here, see up here in Northwest Wyoming, they do nest in 
um, Yellowstone. But the Sag Zim bog is probably one of the easiest places to see them because there's roads going through vast tracts of bog. It is a circumboreal species. It's found from Scandinavia to Siberia to Saskatchewan to Sag Zim bog. And here's a map. So looking straight down on the North Pole. So you can see it does not have a small range. It's not a rare owl at all. It is a rarely seen owl. <laughs> and that's a big distinction for humans. <laughs> but they, you know, the, this is the type of habitat you'd expect them in, right? That kind of that beautiful boreal forest, tamarack, black spruce. This one's over in um, by Grand Rapids. But then we get these eruptions and these owls will show up all over. You know, the one on the, the left here is in Birch Forest up by Gooseberry Falls. You know, that bird didn't nest there. That bird came from farther north of Minnesota or Canada because the voles had uh, population had dropped out on them. And so they were hunting, looking for a new population of voles to exploit. Same with the bird on the right in the willows, right? It's just looking for voles, but it's not their nesting habitat. Check out these numbers, 5,000. What does that mean, Sparky? 5,000. That is the estimated number of great grays that swarmed into Minnesota during the eruption of 2004, 2005. How about 200? What's that? I know several guides, several birders that went out in one day, 24 hour period, and counted over 200 great gray owls in one day. 116. That was my record that year. I saw 116 owls in one day, great gray owls in one day. And that was with, um, I was guiding back then. I used to guide and I had a photographer, one of the most famous wildlife photographers in the United States, Tom Mangelson with me. And, and we just went nuts. And it was one of those things where you could drive around and, and he, he said, oh, no, let's, you know, the first nine you stop and you're like, oh, wow, how great, great. After number 10, you're like, keep going, keep going. You know, just finding one on a pretty perch. <laughs> That's all we were doing. So we just drove around looking for ones on pretty purchase. Um, 116 in one day. 70, and that's what I told you before, um, the Christmas bird count circle in Sac Zim that winter. We had 70 in the 15-mile diameter circle. So these eruptions happened. That was the perfect storm. Uh, a big swath of Canada, Manitoba, Ontario had a really cold, wet summer, and the voles were already at uh, a low population in their cycle and they just didn't reproduce. Oh, and I forgot to say that. Voles are active all winter, unlike a uh, lot of rodents. And so they're a winter food. But that year, uh, very little voles in Canada and they just flooded into Minnesota. And evidently we had a lot of voles. There was one field in Aiken County that I think there was about a dozen owls hunting one hay field. 97% of their diet is voles. You know, what's that big owl doing hunting little voles? But they have small little feet and a small little beak. They're not like a great horned owl. They don't have giant talons to rip apart and catch rabbits and skunks. And what do they do all day? They sit on those tip tops of branches. This one's on a little tamarack and just barely bending it over. So, you know, two pounds. They're not going to bend over these treetops, even though they look massive. And they'll use anything as a perch um, because that's what they do. They just sit on perches and wait, listening for voles. And that's the key. They're listening for voles. Yeah, they'll sit on anything. They'll sit on anything. That one in the middle, I watched a train roll by, you know, 30 miles, 40 miles an hour, um, taconite train. Uh, didn't phase it. It jumped down in the snow and caught a vole right as the train was going by. So... But look at their their uh, feathers. It kind of matches the spruce bark. And eventually, well, I should say they hunt dawn and dusk primarily. They're not middle of the day hunters. They're not middle of the night hunters. They're not nocturnal like great horned owls. But how in the world do they find these voles, especially under the snow. It is said that a great gray can hear 
a vole scurrying under two feet of snow from a hundred yards away. Just, just imagine that, you know, think of a football field buried under two feet of snow, great gray sitting on one field goal, uh, goal post can hear it all the way at the zero yard line <laughs> at the other end under the snow. Those big facial discs, you know, they're, they're not seeing these voles at all. Their eyes are, they're not, you know, their vision is not that great. They are hearing. So those big facial discs collecting that sound, acting like a, a satellite dish, a radar dish, parabolic reflector, and focusing it on their ear holes. And their ear holes are asymmetrical and on the front of their face. So their ear hole here, ear hole here, they're a little different size and shape. Now, remember that, because we're going to talk about how they catch them. Then. So they might hear it, yes, from under two feet, 100 yards away, they might hear one, they jump off that perch, start heading towards that sound. Okay, they're heading towards the sound. They don't know exactly where it is yet. Big, giant, wide wings so they can fly really slow. A lot of wing loading on those wings. Now they're getting close. Now he's getting close. She's tilting her head down. And now she's pinpointing. Because remember, those ear holes are asymmetrical. So the sound reaches them at just a slightly different time and, and frequency. And she can triangulate the exact position. Once triangulated, once locked on, just dive straight down. And at the last second, throws its legs forward and plunges through the snow. They can reach down 12 to 18 inches under the snow to grab a vole. Sometimes they don't get it on the first try. But what this owl is doing, it looks like it's looking into the snow, but it's not. It's listening, and its feet under the snow are moving around, trying to grab it under the snow. <laughs> I also want to say that they can, the picture on the left there, they can bust through crust, crusty snow that, you know, could support the weight of a 180 pound human. So, you know, not a lot phases them, you know, three feet of snow, four feet of snow, that doesn't phase them because the voles have to come up for oxygen as well. So yeah, amazing hunters, they pull that vole out, look around, they're looking for ravens, anybody who's going to steal that vole from them. And then they gulp it down in, in, in one gulp, just uh, you know, the entire vole in one in one gulp. Sometimes, <laughs> I just had to throw this photo in. Now, there's a little conflict sometimes. Um, check it out. This is uh, Tim Halverson's amazing photo. This was in the Sac Zimbog a few years ago. This great gray caught a vole. It's in its beak. And this little hawk owl wanted that vole. And so he came in and tried to grab it right out of the mouth of the great gray. I mean, you know, you never know if you're going to have an experience like this in the bog. But um, I just thought that was so cool. I don't think it had been documented either, that kind of behavior. I got to tell you a quick story about this owl. This guy was yawning. He was exhausted. This was over by Grand Rapids. And this was in summer, this was in June. And I know exactly why he was exhausted because he's providing all the food for the female and the nestlings. And so he's hunting, you know, all day long. He was just, he would just, his eyes would start to close and then he'd jerk awake like, oh God, I gotta get more voles, gotta get more voles. Because back at the nest, mom was with the nestlings and, uh, you know, they need their, their voles. And then a few, about a week later, um, they jumped out of the nest. I think they were th about three weeks old. And, you know, people find owls, and this is just a little tip for everyone. If you find an owl on the ground, do not pick it up. Do not move it, you know, unless there's immediate danger from uh, cats or dogs or people. You know, um, the best thing you can do is either leave it on the ground or put it up on a, you know, a perch, like a picnic table or a a log stump because mom knows exactly where they are. Mom has not lost her babies. She knows exactly where they are. She'll come and feed them. And that's what normally happens in the woods. They, they, they always fledge before they can fly always. And then they'll just get up on these stumps and wait and beg for mommy to come feed them. Mommy or daddy. And that's exactly what happened to these guys. That's normal. 
check out this guy. It doesn't look like a great gray. He's all skinny and it's, you know, well, this is interesting. Uh, I witnessed this a few years ago and I looked up, what's he looking at? What's he looking at? Cause he got skinny and then he backed up right to the trunk to kind of complete the camouflage. Like he was just another snag. And it was a raven, a couple ravens, and uh, they're not big on ravens, I'll tell you that. <laughs> ravens do not kill great grays, but there's something going on there. Another enemy is bald eagles. Bald eagles will certainly, you know, if they could, um, I've seen that same behavior when they see a bald eagle. Bald eagles would certainly kill a great gray if they could, uh, but the big predator is great horned owls. Owls eat owls. I know it's it's hard to... Hard to think about, but owls eat owls. So bigger owls eat smaller owls, but great horned owls are heavier and they will kill great grays. Fortunately, great grays are usually active in the daytime and roosting at night and great horns are hunting at nighttime, but but they can be a, a significant predator of great grays. The only predator, main predator of great grays. And great grays, I don't like to use the word tame, but they're just tolerant. They're not used to humans. A lot of the boreal species uh, in northern Minnesota, just aren't are that worried about humans. Uh, this great gray was hunting at a bird feeding station on Admiral Road. This was a guy I was guiding. <laughs> he got a, a selfie with the great gray, and the great gray just kept hunting. He was just looking for voles down below the, the, the sunflower seed feeders. So you can have any kind of experience in, in Sag Zim. You could be all alone with a great gray flying right over your head, or you could be with uh, 30 of your best friends. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> taking photos. But one thing's for sure, seeing a great gray is a very exciting lifetime bucket list experience. And we tell people at the Welcome Center, you know, where the owls are being seen. So we're not hiding locations. But yeah, if you, I've got video of all this stuff, you know, one of the ones you might want to watch is, it's called How Great Gray Owls Hunt. And our head naturalist Clinton and I teamed up on this one. I did the video. He did the the narrating. Um, it's on YouTube. You can just Google Clinton's Critters Great Gray Owl or Sparky Great Gray Owl YouTube. But it's it'll show you exactly uh, what we just talked about, but uh, in in uh, HD video. Hawk owls, another of our northern charismatic owls. Hawk owl, why hawk owl? Well, look at that tail. Look at how long that tail is. Look for a teed up football, I say. They're about the size and shape of a football. They're a day hunter. They enjoy sleeping in and getting to bed early. Once again, extremely tolerant. We'll use any perch they can find, uh, fearless of humans, um, but they hate gray jays or Canada jays. They hate ravens. Um, but humans, eh, they're fine. 90% voles. But you can kind of get a sense of the size of this bird when you see that vole. And look at the size of the talons, you know. For, for a small bird, it's got vole-sized talons. And I wrote catching and caching. They hunt a lot by eyesight, but also have good hearing, asymmetrical ears. But... Um, very good eyesight. I've seen them fly out from a perch and fly close to, a well, probably over a quarter mile and drop down and catch a vole. Unbelievable. They eat 90% voles, but they'll eat birds like red poles and other birds they see. But check out this. This was in our calendar a few years ago. Tom Wohler captured one that caught a ermine. And uh, yeah, why not? This is the owl that put the Saxon bog on the map. Have you heard the one about the traveling preacher? This was 1963. He was zipping down County Road 7 near Meadowlands, slammed on the brakes because he saw a hawk owl in summer. At that time, they were not known to nest in the lower 48 at all. He got out of his car and there was not one, but two, three, four, five, six, six, two adults and four babies. Uh, it was really um, one of the one of the first confirmed lower 48 records uh, of nesting hawk owls. And then word got out to the Minnesota Ornithologist Union and uh, people have been coming to the Saxon bug ever since 1963. But here, here, here you can see the map showing their only breeding range and it's, it's tenuous. They 
probably don't, you know, there's probably just a handful of breed in Minnesota every year. Um, we, we put some money into science and research and Hannah from the University of Minnesota Duluth caught one last year because we want, thought, where in the world do these owls come from? You know, usually they're only in the, in the bog in the winter. And we put a tracker on it. And um, I don't know if we got our answer, but <laughs> at first the owl went towards Duluth and then it changed its mind in April and went towards Red Lake and then ended up near War Road in May. And then the transmitter quit transmitting. So we don't know if it kept on going to Canada, but we're still trying to answer that question. Where do these hawk owls come from? Where do they go? We do know that this owl is disturbance dependent. Um, they like logged areas. They like burns, forest fires, and especially if there's snags. Now I'll show you this, this snag right here. This one is where a hawk owl nested a few years ago and it's near the welcome center. It was right after they had logged it that winter. But they like that open air. They need that kind of open area for hunting and they use these snags for nesting. And they raised uh, three or four, I can't remember, three or four are young in the top of this snag. And the young are just way down in there. <laughs> this is Dave Grosich's photo uh, of a different nest, but they're just wedged down in there. You can see three here, maybe four. Um, mom comes and feeds them, or sorry, dad brings the food. Uh, mom will tear it up at first, but then, you know, even when they're little, they're they're trying to swallow these whole voles. And then once again, like I said, remember they fledge before they can fly. And then they they have these very sharp talons and they go up this these trunks or these stumps. This one went about 20 feet up and joined his little brother in the tree. And then they just beg like crazy. They just sit there waiting, you know, where's mom? Where's mom? Where's mom? I want food. I want food. I'm hungry. I'm hungry. And they just scream and screech and, and uh, you know, maybe they stretch a little, but yeah, they're babies. They want food. And then they, they stretch their wings. They exercise their wings, do a little flapping, you know, because soon they'll need to fly. Boreal owl, this is kind of the trifecta of northern owls that are, is on everybody's list to see. Boreal is probably the hardest one. They're strictly nocturnal uh, until you know, there's an eruption and they are erupt about every four to eight years, a little more regularly than other owls. Um, and, you know, eruptions are kind of a double-edged sword, right? Because they're great for birders and photographers. We get to see them, but it's not good for the birds. They're stressed. They're trying to um, find food uh, in conditions that are tough. Nesting in Minnesota, question mark. <laughs> well, Kim Eckert, some of you might know Kim. He's um, He just put out his latest edition of his Birder's Guide to Minnesota, kind of the guru of Minnesota birding. He and I, uh, I think Terry Savaloy uh, found the first nesting boreal owl in the lower 48 in Cook County, Minnesota in 1978. So amazing find. Uh, since then, uh, and this is what's kind of amazing about research. Um, we didn't know there was a Rocky Mountain population at all. How, you know, how could that be? How did we not know there was a population in the Rocky Mountains? They get all the way into New Mexico. <laughs> but we've learned a lot in the last 40 years, that's for sure, about the boreal owl. One showed up at the Admiral Road bird feeders in Sac Zim a few years ago. And during these eruptions, when they're hungry, they'll hunt during the daytime because the voles are a little more active. Um, under the feeders there. And it drew a crowd, let's just say that it, but everybody was well behaved, um, stayed back. The boreal, the owl was totally unfazed. You know, you see this and you think, oh, we're stressing the owl, but these people were far enough back. The owl, you know, hardly even looked at the people. Um, he did look at this squirrel. <laughs> and that squirrel used the same tree to get to a feeder. And so, They'd just stare at each other and then they'd go on their, you know, resume their normal life. But great photo by Peter Kaufenberg. It was in our, our one of our calendars for the bug. Like I said, eruptions every four to eight years. It'll be probably another year or two before we get another eruption. But adorable, huh? Adorable. 
and pellets, right? They eat these voles whole, they swallow them whole. So of course, then they have to cough up pellets. And those are two pellets we collected and sent to the Bell Museum, um, you know, so they could analyze their, their diet, which was almost assuredly just voles. But yeah, once again, they, they're just hearing them below the snow. They plunge down, there's a plunge hole on the right. Um, in my video, I'm gonna uh, share a link to, it's in the, be in the show notes as well, but um, you can watch a boreal owl hunt and plunge down into the snow. Yeah, so it's, I did it about the boreal, the big boreal owl eruption that actually came all the way to Duluth. This was up on um, just kind of by, between Duluth and two harbors. Um, so if you just Google Sparky Boreal Owl YouTube, yeah, it's it's a fun little, very short video, but um, you can see the most adorable of all owls. The Sawet, more of us are familiar with now the Sawet owl, but it's, it's still mainly a Northeast Minnesota breeder. This was, um, I, when I used to guide, there was a group of ladies, um, um, who I would guide, and uh, they must have been good luck. One year we found a boreal owl, one year we found a sawit owl in the bog. Um, and yeah, so they, they must be really good luck. But a note, oh, sorry. Note it's frosty eyelashes. It was about 25 below zero. And this is one of our migratory. This is the first mi really migratory owl we've talked about. Eruptions are more movement in search of food. Migration is, you know, this is kind of more of a true migration. The sawets go from that uh, pink area and many of them move down into the Southern and Central US during the winter. This is one I found up on um, the Echo Trail. Um, I don't know if you scratch on trees, but I scratch on trees a lot that have uh, old pileated woodpecker holes because all kinds of things use old pileated woodpecker holes for nesting. Um, they pileates are a keystone species. We a lot of these birds would be in trouble if we didn't have pileated woodpeckers creating homes for them. So a little sawet picked it, popped its head out of the hole. This is another one up by Ely. Um, this is more of a natural cavity where a branch used to be, but they are cavity nesters. They will use nest boxes like kestrel boxes. This one was on one of our boardwalks in the bog. Um, and then what we use for our kestrel nesting program is a big go or a big pole with a GoPro on the end. So it's it's far less intrusive than getting a ladder, banging it up against a tree, crawling up, opening up, and sticking your big fat human head inside these boxes. So um, these birds, the kestrels, get used to it right away. We just, just they're like, oh golly, here comes the GoPro again. And the one thing I want to show you here is she's got her eggs back here. You see one, two, I think there was four. But then look at, she's sitting on one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, maybe eight voles. So the male was doing an incredible job of providing her with food. Um, yeah, just a very interesting uh, experience to follow her. But then in winter, uh, well, I should say in spring is probably the easiest time to find sawets over most of Northern Minnesota. Uh, or the northern half, actually. You can go out in April and go out after dark on a calm night and just listen. Just listening for that tooting of the saw at all. You might not see them, but at least you'll hear them. But in winter, they'll go to bird feeders and they'll sometimes just sit by these bird feeders like this pudgy guy, just waiting for a vole to come out and eat sunflower seeds. And other times you find them different ways. This was on McDavitt Road. And this guy was a, a group from a commune in Iowa that I was guiding and he went in the woods to uh, go to the bathroom. And all of a sudden we hear from the road, you guys, you gotta come in here. And we're like, okay, what? <laughs> but then he said, I had a saw it all. So yeah. yeah, it works many ways, I guess. Now, remember I talked about that they're migratory. Here's Hawk Ridge's banding totals just from the last six or seven years. And you can really see that four-year vole cycle. Look at 2020. They banded 1,670 
Sawets just in, you know, the two months that they're banding. And then skip to four years before that, 1,732. And in the meantime, it goes down. So in another two years, well, 2024, it'll probably be back up to 16, 1700. Uh, but they also banned a lot of long ears. We're going to get to them, but they're also semi migratory. Snowy owls, this is one a lot of us love. Um, you know, we don't get to see them every year. Um, good places to find them are. Um, you know, the Minneapolis St. Paul Airport, I know there was usually one hangs out there. Airports are great um, because, well, we'll get to that in a second, but look at the range map. I mean, you know, they're a, they're a high tundra nesting species, right? You know, but they'll come way south in winter on some years. But they look up, you know, when they get to Minnesota, they're not just looking for forest. They're not looking for forest at all. They're looking for open habitat that reminds them of the tundra that has voles. And that's why airports are popular, um, you know, big open farm fields. They probably love it down here because in the tundra, there's no perches, right? <laughs> They're probably like, oh yeah, we get to go vacation in Minnesota and there's a lot of perches. So the hunting is easier. How about a hay bale? Let's use a hay bale. So there's a little confusion when it comes to eruptions with snowy owls, you know, is it good or bad? And that's, you know, from the owl's perspective or human perspective. So this year, there's probably not going to be many snowy owls seen in Minnesota because, and you'd think that's because there's a lot of food in the Arctic, but it's probably because there's not much lemmings in the Arctic last summer. So when there's few lemmings in the Arctic, they don't lay as many eggs. They don't produce as many young, many, more young die. And so they, um, there, there aren't these, you know, big pushes to the south because in a really good lemming year the owls will lay a bunch of eggs they'll raise a bunch of young and then come winter the young have to find somewhere to hunt and they keep getting pushed out of other owls habitats uh, uh territories and so they're pushed kind of essentially down into the the u.s and southern canada so it is it's a little bit confusing but they're they're extremely tied to the lemming cycle which is also about every 4 years. So when they get down here, you know, even though they're very capable of killing a rabbit, um even a jackrabbit, um they usually just eat voles. I there was one in Duluth at some soccer fields a few years ago and there was this game farm pheasant that would just walk around. It was, you know, totally out of place. And that snowy owl just ignored it totally. You know, it could have killed it and had a meal, quite a meal, a feast, but it just ate voles. Now this one, this is way up in um, Northwest Minnesota. And that's another good place to go. Glacial Ridge and just all those um, empty spaces up in Northwest Minnesota. Uh, this one was using the railroad tracks to kind of hide itself um, and get out of the wind. The wind was like 40 miles an hour. But like I said, airports are are pretty good. You'll see them on at the the one on the left is at Menards. Um, <laughs> you know, any place that's open, this is the Menards owl. He'd go back and forth between the in, in Superior, Wisconsin, um, the airport and Menards. And in the old days, the industrial port of Duluth was quite a place to find them up to 20 to 30 would winter in the port of Duluth because it was a weedy mess and there was open dumpsters there were rats and pheasants and bunnies uh, well what happened like 15 years ago is 20 years ago they cleaned up the port right so you don't get those big concentrations anymore but but every winter there's maybe a half dozen in the Duluth Superior Port this one's sitting on the muffler of a bulldozer and here's one in Superior at the, uh, the refinery. <laughs> they don't care. And the school, the middle school in Superior. But hey, I can I can imagine they love a good tree. They get a much better view looking for those voles. Now everybody says these really white ones are males, and that's probably true. The really white pale ones are the older adult males. Really gorgeous birds. Now they're much, much smaller than these big females who are often heavily spotted. Um, 
but you gotta you, you should say it's probably a female because there's been a lot of research that males can be heavily spotted and um, but it's likely that this is a, a a female or a young one long-eared owls this was my nemesis for so long so long finally found some but um tough bird to find they are strictly nocturnal of course ears no those aren't ears those are ear tufts long-eared owl is rarely seen in the daylight but they look a lot like short-eared owls i'll tell you when they're flying around also a vole eater that's a baby long-eared you can't mistake them <laughs> they have that black mask short-eared owls are more of a prairie open grassland species you can see there across the northern the the orange is where they nest northern tier states and they nest up in northwest minnesota um, armstrong wetlands near owatonna is a good place to look for them as well in the tundra this is way up by hudson bay they like any open country tundra is open why not But short ears or short ear tufts, also on YouTube, I've got an experience with both these species. Great horned owl, what? Yeah, not horns. Once again, ear tufts, and you can see them very well, even silhouetted. They don't make their own nests. They use the nests of other birds. The barred owl. Now they're strictly nocturnal until winter. When they get hungry, they'll nest or they'll hunt in the daytime. Here's one nesting in a birch snag and the babies are adorable. Of course, you've maybe heard about this. They've, look at the map, they've moved into the Pacific Northwest. Uh, the government wants to shoot and kill 500,000 owls. I don't know. I think it's a losing cause. I think, spotted owls are probably in trouble out there um i don't think killing 500,000 barred owls is the answer playing god in this to this level is uh i don't know <laughs> anyway uh barn owls very rare there's only been about a dozen records since 2000 brewing owl very rare in minnesota there's been three nesting documented since 1991 extremely rare hopefully they'll come back so, yeah, I want to get to questions here. You guys know the Sags and Bog. There it is. And we are, a, you know, a big area, 300 square miles of habitat. Um, how do you see a great gray? Well, I'm going to leave this slide for another time, but uh, you can watch it in the replay. But there's a lot of tips here on how to uh, find a great gray. So just to end, um, we are a land preservation organization, primarily with an emphasis on education. We buy up land and, you know, black, we're not anti-logging, but black spruce takes a hundred years to grow back to maturity. You know, Google Earth can be a blessing and a curse. Poof, poof, there it goes, you know. So we've been buying up lands for this Owls and Warblers corridor, corridor project. We added another 3,200 acres last year. We're about to add another 20,000 acres um and and pete sphagnamos is the unsung hero of climate change it it sequesters tons of carbon and we estimated um that we our lands have sequestered 814,000 metric tons so far so we're going to keep going we've got a new education center come on up we're open till march 9th every day seven days a week except christmas day um, educational stuff programming and virtual field trips. We've got 40 of mine and Clinton's got a dozen of his, so you can find those on the internet. And boardwalks all over. Pick up your Augie's owls. They're free on one of the boardwalks. I'm gonna make you guys do the research on which one. But thank you so much. It was fun. I'll take questions now. Thank you, Sparky. That was awesome. It was good to see. I've been up there and seen a great grade in the past. And it's it's a pretty spectacular experience. So I encourage anybody to get up there. So I want to give a, a quick shout out to Miss Wetzland's class, third grade class, joining us from Rogers, Minnesota. So 
Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. If you have a question, please pop it in the Q&A there. So uh, one of them, CE was asking, when was the last eruption in northern Minnesota? Talking about the owls eruption. Uh, about uh, four or five years ago, there on uh, up by two harbors, there was a, a um, little mini eruption up Highway 2. Um, there hasn't been a big eruption in a while, but we have resident great grays in Sac Zim. You know, there's probably, we don't know, maybe six to two dozen pairs that nest there and are there year round. So you can, you know, you can find them. It might take a little more work, but they're there. But yeah, we haven't had an eruption for a while. And you don't want to say, oh, I'm waiting for another eruption because it's it's hard on the birds, no doubt. Yes, I, I remember that one in, it was 2004. Yeah, 04, 05, yeah. yeah. So, uh, Susan, how many voles do they eat each day? Yeah, good question. Uh, and, I, and I didn't. I was going to say that they, um, you know, if if they'll, you know, you know, I think they'll catch as they'll catch as many as they can, great grays and hawk owls. But if they get too full, they'll just start caching them, and the ravens will try and steal the caches. And uh, so it's not a surefire thing. But they'll, you know, uh, you know, I I've seen one eat uh nine in a row um i'm guessing that'll fill up a great great <laughs> yeah it's, it's probably you know three to nine or ten okay uh jason was wondering does the screaming and calling for food attract predators you're talking about the little ones yeah that's a really food. yeah good question um uh it probably does but um uh, i've never you know, I've never read a paper on that to see, you know, because that, that would make sense that, a, you know, bobcat or uh, coyote would be attracted to that. That's that's a really good point. And that's probably why they try and get up, you know, as high as they can. But you saw some of those great grays were just on stumps that were a foot or two tall. But I'm guessing maybe later they would try and find that, especially an angled tree like those hawk owls, to try and get up higher. But yeah, good point. Alicia had a question about the transmitters. How big are the transmitters you use in an owl, and how are you, how do you attach them? So this is, um, you know, this is going to be the future of a lot of bird research. Is the technology has just accelerated, and you know, you by law you can only put a transmitter of any kind on a bird that's. It's like oh, it's a percentage of their weight, so it's it's highly controlled, and now with the technology getting smaller and smaller, you can put it on these smaller and smaller birds. This is the first, you know, uh, research of its kind in the in anywhere in the world where we people have put transmitters on hawk owls. And you can't do it on great grays or any other owl really because they're all um, nighttime. They're not perching in the open because these are solar powered. They have a little solar panel on their back. And so hawk owls sit out in the open in the sun and during the day. So they, you know, they it works on them. but. But the technology is, is improving. They catch them. Um, they they use uh, mice and a big fishing net um, is what they use. But um, they, the birds it doesn't affect the birds or their flight or anything like that. So, bunch of those future scientists out there will come up with awesome oh, ideas on how to try. I think it's going to be amazing what we see in the next coming decades with this technology, because um, yeah. we don't know a lot of things about where these birds come and go. We're doing research on evening grosbeaks, northern shrikes in the bog right now as well. Uh, Kim was wondering, you're talking about coughing up the pellets. Do all those poop? They do, uh, but um, the indigestible parts, the hair, the bones are, are come up this way. <laughs> But yes, they they also do um, they do have feces. It de and it depends a lot on their uh, diet too. You know, in summer they're eating a lot more uh, juicy stuff. <laughs> Bard owls, um, you know, and screech owls will eat worms and and um, snakes and frogs and stuff like that. Uh, yes. And Bridget was wondering, what is a vole? We can compare them to mice so, a little bit, but they're a little bit different. They're they're bigger than mice, but have a shorter tail. So they have they're adorable, but they're like little mini sausages. You know, they're like that long. Meadow voles are bigger, so there's more calories in a meadow vole than a redback vole. But they're they're just they're a type of rodent, um, shorter tail than a mouse, shorter ears, um, active all winter under the snow. 
reproducing in the winter under the snow. They're a little smaller cousin to the lemmings. Yeah. Okay. Um, Dale is inquiring about guides and how you arrange for one. I'm guessing they could probably reach out to you and yeah, guide it, you know, a guide is a great way to um, see the bug. Um, if you go to saczim.org, just the sazim.org, we have six or seven guides listed on there. Um, that's what they do. That's their profession. It's usually about two, 200, 300 a day. And, but it's, it's, it can be worth it. You know, if you plan a two day trip or a three day trip, you know, get a guide for the first day, get oriented. Maybe they can find you the, you know, the great gray and the hawk owl right away. Um, but we also on our website also put a bird and wildlife report. We updated it every week. We try to update it every week. Um, as you probably know, eBird doesn't report locations, exact locations of great gray owls and hawk owls. So you know, but if you swing by the Welcome Center, we'll tell you where they are. Um, and then it's up, you know, this is not all our land. This is a ton of Minnesota state land and tax forfeited land. So people have to police themselves with their behavior. And, and uh, you know, it's it's only a small fraction of Sagsenbog is owned by friends of Sagsenbog. I just wanted to say that. And, and when you're driving down the roads, keep an eye on your rearview mirror. You know, there's local folks that live there and are trying to get to work and school, um, pull over and let people go by, stay ahead of snow plows, uh, but watch out for those ditches. We There's at least a car every day stuck in the ditch um, during <laughs> snowy winters. So, but we, we only have like that much snow right now. So yeah, be, be a good steward and uh, yeah. be kind to of people out there. So, exactly. I, Carol was asking, is it a good idea to build nesting boxes for owls? Use nesting boxes. Yeah, that's it's fun <laughs> for humans and it is useful for owls. And you can do this anywhere you are in Minnesota. Um, you know, just kind of Google barred owl box uh, plans, um, sawwood owl box plans. You'll find them on the internet yeah, and put them up in appropriate habitat. So barred owls and sawwood owls want to be in the woods. They want to be in the woods. Um, you know, of course, kestrels are out in the open. Um, great grays don't nest inside of um, boxes. They You can build platforms, and we have tried that. Um, uh, you know, you need somebody highly motivated, quite young, because <laughs> you got to be climbing for, you know, 20, well, 30 feet up in these trees, hauling this stuff. And, uh, yeah, it's not the safest uh, thing to make great gray <laughs> nest platforms. But, you know, barred owls and, and especially saw it so they'll nest much lower down and um but yeah it's they do it in scandinavia especially finland and sweden and norway um for great gray owls uh and they've had a lot of success um because you know they're using old raven nests and old broad-winged hawk nests red-tailed hawk nests and those are sometimes you know uh, in short supply. So it is something we'd like to expand, a program we'd like to expand for sure. Cool. We got a ton of questions. We're never going to get through them all. So I'm going to apologize <laughs> to some of you now. Um, Gordy had an interesting one. Uh, can you do something around calls and see in here tonight? That doesn't work very good. The one little call you did doesn't translate very well over WebEx because the microphones don't pick it up real well. But oh. I'm sure. You know, go to YouTube and you'll be able to find some of those things on there too. So, uh, one question Jeff had was, do owls tend to lay more eggs on peak vol years, or are they laying tendencies consistent year to year? Yes, good, good, um, definitely. Um, you know, that's definitely true with snowy owls for sure. Um, and that's a really good question. I'm guessing it is true for. Uh, some of the very vol dependent species, but you know what? I don't know if I know the answer to that, but, um, and you know, there's such a small uh, s uh, number of nests that have ever been found and studied too. So that's part of the problem is, you know, they're, they're in remote um, parts of the bogs in April, you know, who wants to be out there in two feet of slushy snow? Uh, so there really isn't a lot of data, but I would guess so. I would definitely guess so. Okay. Carol's wondering how will climate change affect the ability to see owls in the future? 
Uh, I don't think it's going to change too much about owls seeing them, but where you're going to find them. And that's, you know, an existential crisis for me, for sure, because as the executive director of and friend and founder of Friends, you know, we're at the southern end of the boreal forest, in, you know, on the continent. And of course, you know, we would be the first to kind of lose maybe the black spruce and tamarack. But um, so, you know, their habitat might move north, um, but I, I don't have a crystal ball. Nobody does. Um, I'm, I'm, what we came down on is that we are buying habitat. Uh, habitat will be habitat. So we put conservation easements on most of these sites. And if, you know, if they're 200 years from now, it's oak savanna, it's still going to be habitat for something. Um, bog might move north, but the bogs also might be a little more resilient because not much can grow in that acidic soil other than black spruce and tamarack. But yes, it is definitely, you know, it's tough something we, we think about because we are at the southern end, so. Yeah. Uh, Jason was wondering, do owls mate for life? Um, that is also a good question. Um, I, I think, you know, they'll mate, they'll probably return to the same mate. Um, if the other mate doesn't return, then they'll just get another mate. <laughs> I don't think it's as, as, uh, strict a rule as with like, um, uh, peregrine falcons and, and other, some other birds, but and another, there's another problem there is they're hard to identify individuals. I mean, you can barely tell males and females apart. So it's, it's hard to tell individuals. So I don't think there's a lot of research on it, to be honest. It's interesting. Uh, Diane was asking about, does the lack of snow make it harder for owls to hunt or easier? You show a lot of snow so, pictures. We don't have much yeah. this year. <laughs> so I was telling Benji about this, the depth of the snow really doesn't matter to most of these owls, especially the northern Minnesota owls, great gray, hawk owl, boreal owl, um, you know, they, they're adapted to deep, deep snows, very bitter cold weather. The weather doesn't have much effect on them. Um, they'll find voles, whether there's no snow or three feet of snow, it doesn't affect them. Um, barred owls, yes, you know, because they're at their northern fringe, you know, they're, they're not quite as well adapted. Um, so some of these other species, um, saw wet for sure. Um, we'll probably move south as we get, you know, we're going to get snow and it's going to get deep. So it's just, they'll just kind of move south. Rough-legged hawks is one of the big ones. They, they're they coming down from the tundra. They can't hear voles under the snow. They can see them. And so they will be moving south out of here when we get the snow. Teresa is wondering, is it important to report great horned or other owl sightings around the Twin Cities? You know, we see them down here. Is it a good idea to report them or a place? Uh, you know, it uh, depends on the behavior or who you're reporting them to. I don't think the DNR is that interested, but eBird uh, hides a lot of locations for owls. Um, I think if it's a, an unusual owl, but I don't think there's, you know, you can keep it to yourself. <laughs> you don't have to report it. Um, but, you know, if it's a rare owl, of course, you know, report it to the DNR. Um, but it's, you know, it's, are people going to behave themselves, especially nests? You might as well keep that nest location to yourself and enjoy it yourself because 20 people can ruin things pretty quickly. So. Yeah. And I know we're just a minute left and we're running out of time. So just a couple of plugs here. We have several questions about tours up at the bog. Yes, you guys do do tours. Come on up, visit the, check out the visitor center talk to the naturalist up there and the other volunteers and see that. Um, and how do people get involved? Either they have a little bit of land or they're interested in getting involved in protecting areas and habitat. So do you want to speak to that just a tad? Yeah, every, I mean, every, uh, our, our website is a treasure trove, saxzim.org. Um, check it out. We, um, we only buy bog, um, but yeah, for opportunities, you know, get, come on up, walk the boardwalks, check with the naturalists. Um, Clinton has a ton of programs. You know, we don't do many bird programs in the winter because, uh, yeah, it's just the guides make a living doing it. And so they, you know, we push people towards the guides. Um, but yeah, check out our field trip offerings. We got uh, tiny bird art fundraiser coming up, six by six or smaller tiny bird art. 
and a birdathon, the world's coldest birdathon coming up in January. So a lot of stuff happening. Well, that sounds like there. fun. In a Friday speaker series at the Welcome Center as well, and our own webinars. Yeah. Awesome. Sparky, thank you so much. It was a super interesting topic and not one we've we featured before. So it was nice to learn a lot more about owls in Minnesota. Getting a lot of thank yous in the Q&A. Uh, next week, if anybody wants to tune in, we're going to, instead of being above, we're going to go down below and, and talk about mud puppies and people catching mud puppies in the winter. So the underwater surface. So hope everybody has a safe and fun weekend out there and we'll see you next week. Thanks again. Thank you.